you know, I, I took this for a while, but then after like a month, I just, I couldn't take it anymore, and I quit. And after, I felt liberated. I was floating on air. But then I realized, wait a minute, as I made my way through the East Village, on my way back to my apartment, I needed this job. I was lucky to have this job. And I felt my heart pounding that I quit. I was a failure. I was nothing but a waitress. I was going to have to be a masseuse who gave happy endings. <laughs> what would I do now? And then, that's when I saw it. Cafe Cento Sette. It was a quaint place, like it would be discovered off the beaten path down a cobblestone road in Florence. It had these huge picture windows that were lined with these tiny white lights. I looked inside, and I saw only small tables, 20 or so, dimly lit by candles, and this woman standing behind this gorgeous mahogany bar, and she was radiating the strength and power, just merely standing there. I was feeling much more like a huge insecure question mark than a confident exclamation point, but even though I was intimidated, my nerves and my desperation propelled me forward. And I asked this woman behind the count, behind the bar for the manager. And she said, I am the manager. And I introduced myself and I told her, look, my name's Erica and I really am the worst waitress in the world. <laughs> but I'm a really hard worker, and I promise if you just show me and guide me, I will be the best, greatest waitress. She looked me up and down. She raised an eyebrow. A slight smile crossed her lips, and she said, be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Wear all black. Bring the pens. <laughs> And the manager's name was Malika, which means queen in Arabic. She told me this as we set the tables with the salt and pepper and Parmesan cheese shakers. She introduced me to the kitchen staff, told me to let her know if Lou got fresh, she'd take care of it. <laughs> and as the customers came in, she just threw me in there to, into the pool. It was sink or swim, and I swam. And with her faith in me, I soon became an expert waitress. I could handle all 20 tables by myself. And I always remembered a face. And I once served a very, very intoxicated Liza Minnelli. <laughs> and I got her to stop smoking cigarettes and sigh. That was no easy feat. <laughs> I used to serve Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman hot chocolate, and I'd bring them extra whipped cream just because I loved them. <laughs> and once, the village voice wrote us up and mentioned the friendliest and the best waitress, me. <laughs> but after four years of working there, despite loving my Cafe Cento Sete family, I was burned out, and my bunions ached. And I was so tired and tormented by auditioning and having meetings with agents and managers who told me again and again, you're too fat. You're not fat enough. <laughs> you're too old. You're too young. Your nose is too big. Your nose isn't big enough. I just wasn't sure I could keep chasing an impossible dream. I mean, I started realizing most people don't ever have their dream come true, no matter how hard they work, how talented they are, or how badly they wanted it, I was realizing I wasn't an actress slash waitress. I was just a waitress. It was a busy Saturday night, and people were queuing up outside, waiting to be seated. And one of the customers, a professor-looking type, had been sitting at a table most of the day, and he had only had a $4 bowl of soup, 
and basket after basket after basket of bread. And you know, the rule was only one basket of bread per customer. <laughs> but I was that great waitress I promised to be all those four years ago. So he got a lot of bread. I told him that now that we really needed this table, that there were so many people waiting, and would he mind like paying and going? And he got pissed. And he started protesting and protesting, and he said I was rude and better not be expecting a tip. And I just snapped. And I slammed open the door of the cafe, and I said, that's it. We don't want your money. Just leave now. And he did, as I asked. He crossed the restaurant. But before I could close the cafe door behind him, he turned back around. And I was in the doorway with my back to the crowded restaurant. And he started choking me. <laughs> and everything suddenly was moving in slow motion, like in a time warp. And the cars and the trucks on busy Third Avenue, the passerbys and the marquee on the theater across the street blurred together, like creating this orange glowing haze around me. Suddenly, my survival instincts kicked in. All the years of being a rough and tumble kid on the playground, and I pulled back, and I thrust my fist right into his gut. And he jumped back, like shocked. And I felt his hands drop from my throat. And he just took off down the street in a full sprint. And everyone in the cafe was stunned. But I assured the customers I was OK before I took a break to collect myself outside the cafe. Chain smoking and wiping away my tears of exhaustion, frustration, and fear. I asked of the sky, what am I going to do with my life? And that's when I heard this sweet voice. Excuse me, excuse me. And I turn and I see this little old lady in a house dress and shoes that were maybe slippers. And she looks at me and she says, I bet you're an actress. <laughs> and she engages me in some conversation. She tells me that she used to want to be a dancer and that there were midnight booze cruises up and down the Hudson, and she danced till her feet were dead. But then someone discouraged her, and she looked at me intently, and she said, don't let anyone discourage you. And she walked away. And as she was walking away, I heard her mutter, you hear me? Don't let anyone discourage you, especially the CIA. <laughs> Those motherfuckers. <laughs> sure, she may have been a little crazy, but it really felt that in that moment that she was dropped from the universe to help me remember to keep on striving. And so I wiped my tears, I held my head high, and I walked back into that cafe like the New York exclamation point I was. <laughs> my hopes and dreams restored. Thank you. <laughs>